Right now, flying is responsible for around 2% of global CO2 emissions, and that number is climbing. But the aviation industry has set a target of net zero emissions by 2050. That's just over 25 years away. So how are we going to get there? Well, I recently had the opportunity to catch up with chief sustainability officers from Boeing, Airbus and United. Here's how they say we're going to get there and how it might impact the way flying looks and feels. What will flying look like in the future? What it will look like in 2050 is a decarbonised flying. Uh, I can't describe what the aircraft will look like by then. Um, it's likely to have wings, it's likely to have an engine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but, but it will be flying in a a de with a decarbonised or a set of decarbonised solutions. Well, I think flying in some ways, things will be in airplanes that people may not readily see. The fuels will be different, the electrical systems will be different, the materials will be different. Well, it'll be similar to today with less emissions, which is exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. The solutions that we're looking at are called drop-in, which means you can actually put them on today's airplanes and just have less emissions. You know, this is this innovation that's occurred in aviation now for decades. And a lot of people don't see those improvements, but they've radically improved fuel efficiency per person, and therefore carbon emissions have gotten less and less. I would say it's very exciting. And I think genuinely, you know, when we decarbonise aviation, it's the, it will be the only mode of transport that can fly from A to B without touching the planet um, in a decarbonised way. So how do we get from 2% of global emissions to net zero in a little under 30 years? It's really about a combination of measures. So there's no one solution that will get us there. Uh, and we're looking at triangulating basically technological developments with a global energy transition and a global regulatory framework or set of policies to be able to support the industry with those measures because it's a global industry we need a global level playing field in terms of regulation. We call it 100% green, which is our commitment to net zero by 2050 without using carbon offsets. And that's really important to us because we are an industry that is described as hard to abate, which means we don't have the solutions at scale today to really make a difference today in the emissions. And so we've got to focus on those solutions that really matter, which is fundamentally sustainable aviation fuels. But we're also talking about new fleet. So renewing our aircraft is really important. We're talking about new design of aircraft, next generation. We're talking about uh, alternate propulsion, so electric and hydrogen, as well as our standard operational efficiencies. So we need everything in the basket to accomplish our goals, and we will. Renewing fleets seem to be a common theme from everyone I spoke to at the show. The first thing you'll hear us talk about is fleet renewal, mm -hmm. because we know that newer, more fuel-efficient airplanes have replaced older, less fuel-efficient airplanes, and we've done a pretty good job at that over time, 15 to 25 percent to 30 percent better each time. United has made an order for hundreds of airlines or uh, airplanes over the next couple of years, and in fact, those are really important to climate ambitions. For example, wide bodies, when you replace a 767 with a 787, those are 25 percent more fuel efficient than the 767. That is a material impact in the emissions that we release when we fly. When you look at narrow bodies, like when you introduce the MAX and the NEO, 20 percent more fuel efficient than those we're replacing. So what role could potential future fuels like hydrogen play in this transition? I can't tell you how much it's going to actually influence our footprint because there's so many unknowns right now. In particular, the infrastructure required to store the hydrogen, the safety issues around flying hydrogen at uh, high altitudes, there is a lot unknown. But what we do know is that hydrogen, in particular green hydrogen, has a lot of promise in the context of sustainable aviation fuel. It as an input to creating these future sustainable aviation fuels that have the potential to be carbon negative, that's really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. But the outstanding issue is this dependency on having access to cost-effective, abundant, renewable power. Until that happens, none of this future around green hydrogen can exist. It's really important that we, that we work on the global energy transition with SAF, which is Im immediately available today, yeah. and prepare the technology with hydrogen for the future. So, when you think about the, the SAF ecosystem and what's required for 2030, in aviation terms, 2030 is tomorrow. When you look at the barriers to entry and the, the cycle length of the product, 2050 is the day after tomorrow. 
So we need to prepare for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow at the same time. The hydrogen powered aircraft that we're targeting is for, for commercial service in 2035 and that will be shorter haul, uh, smaller capacity aircraft initially, initially until we've got the technology to scale. So it won't make a, a big uh, dent in the 2050 net zero target but it's about starting with the appropriate technology because when we get that hydrogen powered aircraft it will be a pure decarbonized solution. So we've learned a lot with hydrogen. We've flown six different forms of airplanes on hydrogen. Some were hydrogen fuel cells. They provided a little bit of electric power on the airplane. Mm -hmm. We flew an airplane, an autonomous airplane, on uh, liquid hydrogen. Yeah. That was quite a learning experience because of the ability to control the temperatures and the pressures of liquid hydrogen. And so we've done a lot of experimentation with it. We'll continue to do it. We just think that its impact uh, on airplanes, airports, and pipelines is greater, and therefore it won't help us as soon as some of these other solutions that are less impactful. And if the goal is 2050, we've got to work on the things that will help us the fastest. But none of these measures are necessarily very cheap. So will that make flying more expensive? Are we, are we at the cheapest point that flying's ever going to be? How do we kind of decarbonize without, you know, ticket fares going up and up and up? Or do does Airbus believe that that's just going to be a natural consequence of, of this path? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And I think ultimately everybody has a role to play. You know, each, each member of the sector is going to have a role to play in terms of the investment required. From an, uh, from an aircraft OEM perspective, we invest more than 2 billion euros a year on predominantly decarbonized solutions or, or developing technologies to achieve those decarbonized solutions. Um, so it's all about scale. These technologies need money now. We are in the process of building a market for these alternative solutions. So it t does take investment. But that's exactly why we have the venture fund, the sustainable flight fund that United has stood up. Mm. But what I will say is that today we don't recognize the price of carbon in how we fly. There is discussion around that, whether it's a carbon border adjustment tax or some of these other policy mechanisms that we're beginning to see here in the EU that are starting to look at putting a dollar associated with carbon. Mm -hmm. The minute that, that, that emissions are recognized with the price associated to it, the economics flip quite significantly. Yeah, I, I think flying has gone up and down. You know, I think the first thing would be jet fuel is not a static price thing either. I mean, there's volatility in jet fuel and, and what people are talking about are the green premiums on anything. In this case, you know, SAF screen premium. And so to some degree that will get uh, leveled out by supply and demand over time, but in the beginning it may cost more. And I think what Willie Walsh at IATA said, you know, is we've bought every drop we can make so far. And so, you know, some of that will might make flying a bit more expensive in the beginning as we deal with this. And, and that that may be the cost of fixing the problem. Today it's three to five times more expensive to put SAF um, in the aircraft than norm, normal jet A fuel, mm -hmm. kerosene. Um, the issue is it's just not available. So we need to, we need to break that vicious uh, cycle of there's no demand because there's no supply and, and it's too expensive. Uh, so, so we really need to, to kind of crack that nut. Even with all of these measures in place, aviation is widely regarded as one of the hardest sectors to fully decarbonize. So I asked all of these chief sustainability officers the same question. Will aircraft keep burning kerosene until there's none left? Or will the aviation industry be able to decarbonize before that point? Uh, you know, I do think we're a hard to abate sector. And so I, I operate every day just with the assumption that the other forms of transportation will either electrify or find their way. I'm not saying anybody's problem is easy. Everybody's problem is challenging. But I will, I will acknowledge that in the air, things are a little different than on the ground. And if you and I you know, had a car that ran out of gas or the gas turned out to not work, we'd pull over and we'd call a friend. And we can't do that in aviation. And that's why you know, technically possible but safely certifiable is so critical in this industry. Well, I think fundamental to that statement is recognizing that we are a hard to abate industry. There's only six or seven industries worldwide that really just need focused attention on building marketplaces for these alternative solutions. So we are going to require time and time is patience. And patience means continuing to operate as we operate now until we commercialize and scale the alternatives we need. 
if we are challenged to have progress tomorrow, it will force us to demonstrate those behaviors that fundamentally are not in the best interest of the planet over time. I think we've got the basket of measures to get there. We see clearly how to get there on the roadmap. Now it's about really driving the action plans on that roadmap to get there. So I'm optimistic. Thank you.